Hello, everybody. Welcome to this last session of Splash. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Byron Cook. I knew him as a researcher at Microsoft, and he moved a couple of years ago, and he's now director of the formal verification part of Amazon. And he will take it from here. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for uh, your time and attention. I assume you'll, attend, you'll, you'll all get your attention. Um, so uh, if you're following the IT press, you may be seeing articles appearing about the use of formal verification tools at Amazon. So for example, in Wired Magazine, there was an article that mentions uh, the automated reasoning group and uh, a couple tools, one called Tiros, one called Zolkova. Um, there was another article in TechCrunch, which um, talked about um, a couple of tools and automated reasoning group, one called Quivola, one called Sidetrail. Um, and that's pretty much the subject of this talk. So I'm going to tell you about this group that uh, I created called the Automated Reasoning Group. We do lots of things within formal methods, formal verification, and Amazon Web Services. And, um, and, and that's, that's the subject of today. The structure of this talk is identical to the structure of a paper I published recently at CAV. Um, which, which uh, much of the information I'm going to convey is also in the paper. So the structure of the paper is, and, and of my talk, is I'm first going to tell you about the cloud. I would assume that some folks in the room will understand the cloud pretty well. I'm going to also assume that uh, a lot of folks don't actually really understand the cloud. I mean, they know about, like, that their photos are in the cloud or that their, like, emails in the cloud, but I, a lot of people are surprised at the scale of how, how actually all of the world's information and is, is largely this very large uh, computer in the sky that we all use in ways that we didn't even know. So I'm going to tell you about the cloud. Um, I'm going to tell you about some security challenges we have in the cloud, um, how we've been operationalizing formal methods to address some of those issues, and then some suggestions for future work for researchers. Uh, in the audience, and then and then an invitation to collaborate. And then it's, uh, something I, I hope a theme comes across in this talk that um, much of the work that we've been doing has has been leveraging or using or has been in partnership with the work that m many of you are doing. So we're well, uh, um, so we're uh, using your tools. Um, often your PhD students are coming and doing internships with us. We're um, uh, uh, collaborating with you, and so on. So I'm having some technical difficulties on this. Hold on. Uh, OK. Um, great. So let's talk about the cloud. Um, first of all, what is the cloud? Formally, it's on-demand access to IT resources. If available via the internet or edge devices. Edge devices turn out to be really important, increasingly important. So there's, for example, we have this, Amazon has this device called Snowball, which is a device that can be mailed to you, and it's a little cloud in the box, and you, there's cloud APIs on it, and you can use it and then mail it back. So you can take, take it to the Antarctic, use it for a while, ship it back. So there's sort of the cloud is in these edge devices, and via, via, to data centers available, the internet via encrypted um, connection to the internet. And the really important bit is it's pay as you go. That's like, the, that's the game changer, right? So pay as you go pricing model changes everything. Um, oh, and I should say, so Amazon Web Services or AWS as I'll call it is the largest by far provider of cloud services. And um, uh, in some sense, the industry w was, was created by Amazon in response to some um, over capacity they had after the holiday market, right? So in, Amazon had many, many, many machines in December, and they didn't need as many machines in January, and so they began to rent them out to to other companies, and that became b b began what nowadays we'd call the cloud industry. Um, here's the AWS console. So um, uh, the the real usage model of the cloud is that there are APIs, and you make you, you make cl you make cloud-based calls to APIs. There's also command line tools, but as a user, often your life begins by going to the AWS console. This is where you go set up things, but it's also a nice way to sort of walk you through all the features that are available in AWS and cloud. So, um, so let's do that really quickly. 
Uh, oh, man, I'm having so many IT problems here. Um, great. Um, so there's compute. The most famous and one of the first uh, services from, from AWS is called EC2 for Elastic Compute Cloud. So this is if you need 10,000 Linux machines tomorrow, zero Linux machines the next day, and then 5,000 Windows machines Thursday, this is what you would do. You would use Elastic EC2. So it allows you to scale up and scale down the number of your computers you need based on demand, and then you, again, it's pay as you go. So you pay for what you use. Um, maybe you don't want to have you know, Linux machines with particular software installed, but you just have a, a, a notion of compute. You just have a Java program and you want to run it, or a Python program and you want to run it. Then you would use something called Lambda. So this is what, what they call serverless compute. Um, and so there's, there's, other, there's other services for compute. There's also storage. So S3 is uh, uh, short for simple storage service. Many, many, many um, of your, um, y uh, your apps and, and uh, websites you use and your, your tax records and your flight schedules all actually reside on Amazon AWS S3. Uh, so this is a big service. Um, and then there's um, uh, databases and there's um, Oh, uh, I won't talk about that. Um, there's management tools, there's um, um, uh, mobile, there's um, uh, machine learning APIs, and there's uh, um, uh, IoT. So there's, there's a wide range of, of services that are available, developer tools. The, um, one of the most interesting things for, for me is these tools for security. So AWS provides services for customers uh, to enhance their security. So for example, there's a service called GuardDuty, which um, uses anomaly detection to look for suspicious activity in your AWS account. Um, there's a service called Inspector, which uh, assesses your AWS configuration, so the machines and how they're networked together, um, and vulnerabilities that might be uh, residing on the currently installed software packages on your instance, on your machines. Um, there's a product called Macy, which uh, look, helps you understand the, um, the kind of data that resides in your AWS account and looks for risky data, data that might be, you know, personally identifiable, they say, so personally identifiable information, and, and looks for data that might not be protected well enough and helps customers understand, um, you know, the, how that data m m might be, could potentially be exfiltrated. Um, and then there's a service called Artifact, which is for customers that are trying to establish, trying to gain uh, compliance certifications, so SOC, uh, PCI, et cetera. So there's a lot, a lot of customers are running regulated workloads, so for HIPAA, for, for, for card, you know, if they handle credit cards, and they, or if they're in the film industry, there's, there's regulation about how you handle data, and so they uh, need to establish certification, and AWS uh, facilitates that with this service called Artifact. Um, so, so one of the cool things about AWS is you can get your application working locally, right? Maybe in a data center near you. And then once you've got the thing behaving in the way you want it to, you distribute it across the world. So there are many geographic regions, many separate availability zones in each of those geographic regions. And so these are the geographic regions that are available to me. There's other geographic regions where you have to sign up for them specially because there's often restrictions on what sort of person could have access to those regions, for example, based on nationality. Um, and as, to summarize, you know, in, in a sense, this is the world's biggest computer, right? And we can program it. So what makes this like super fun is you have this like computer that scales across the earth, growing exponentially. I'll talk about that in a few moments. There's these amazing APIs for, for building your computer program and then running them on this, the largest computer on earth, uh, which is pretty neat. So, um, the existence of this uh, computer is causing this massive change in the industry. So you see uh, a, a lar very large uptake uh, by 
governments, by individuals, by corporations moving away from data centers that they operate themselves and moving all of their data to the cloud, their their work computational workloads and their data. and so we we say they're moving from from on-premises to to the cloud. and this creates this virtuous cycle where the larger the and aws grows the more economy of scale we operate at which means we can invest in things that the you know a johnson and johnson or a goldman sachs couldn't in the us navy for example they ran their own data centers they didn't have the economy of scale to invest in things like formal verification which we'll talk about in a few moments um, and so so that's uh, the, the, the sort of the great thing for us as a community for the cloud um, and this saves the customers from having to do what we call undifferentiated heavy lifting so if you want to learn there's a lot of great uh, I'm just going to do a couple ads for some talks that I, th I, I think are really neat. So these are d deep, deeply technical talks. So there's a talk by uh, someone named Anthony, Anthony Liguori. These are all available on YouTube. Um, Anthony Liguori is one of the um, senior principal engineers in charge of the, virtual, the virtualization stack. So uh, the, you know, the, the, the data, the um, uh, you know, processors, the hypervisor, all of that sort of level of uh, of uh, structure that facilitates the cloud. And he has a technical talk that was at reInvent, which is the AWS technical conference. It's, I think last year there were 45,000 technical people who showed up to reInvent. And, the, and, the, and the, with the growth, it'll probably be 40% more this coming year. Um, so he gave a, a very nice technical talk about the, the technical details of the, of the um, virtualization stack. And if you want to learn more about the um, networking or the um, the data center design, the cooling. Uh, there's a talk by someone named James Hamilton, again, very, very technical. So he talks, for example, and I think in this slide he's talking about the, the, uh, the uh, design of the underwater cabling that connects up the data centers around the world. Um, and then if you want to learn more about the business, so this is a talk by Andy Jassy. He's the CEO of AWS, and he's talking about all of the different kinds of customers and uh, industries that have, have moved to the cloud. And there's a lot of detail about different, different customers, uh, many of whom have gone all, all in on AWS, so they, they actually don't operate their own data centers at all. Um, and, um, um, yeah. So I wanted to give you a few numbers about the... Uh, speed that this thing is growing, which I find really breathtaking. Um, so qu quarterly, AWS reports, so just look at the finances, right? Quarterly, the growth is on 45% year-over-year growth. Every, every quarter we, we report those numbers. And so the, 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 the growth uh, is massive in terms of revenue, but also in terms of growth of, like, for example, the availability zones, or in, or in terms of the growth of the geographic regions. Um, we have millions of active customers, and one, one thing to remember is that for each customer, often there are many users, many teams in those customers. So a Goldman Sachs is a customer, and so then there are many teams within Goldman Sachs using, um, using AWS. Um, the, uh, Probably belaboring the point a little bit, but this is there's two more fun facts, and then we'll 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 I'll stop trying to tell you how cool the cloud is. Um, uh, in 2015, AWS added enough server capacity every day to run all of Amazon.com in 2005. Right, and that was in 2015. Right, and so if you see if you think about the exponential scale. The scale that we're operating, the, the, the amount of capacity we're adding every day now is much larger than this. And this is the growth of the developers showing up to this conference, reInvent. It's in Vegas because it's the only city big enough that has enough hotel, hotel rooms. Um, and so last year there were 45,000 developers. So when I give a talk, at, at reInvent, it's really insane. Like, the, the size of the audiences are really, really staggering. <laughs> um, great. So that, that's, I, I hope, I hope you've, I've convinced you that the cloud's sort of an interesting problem. Um, so, um, so one of the surprises for me, leaving the, you know, the ivory tower formal methods community and joining AWS, is that 
the formal methods really solves a crucial business problem that aws has. so aws that growth of features, all of this all of the 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 um the the increased revenue, increased customers, increased feature growth uh, are driven by features that customers are asking for. And so they're adding an exponentially growing number of features every year. And for each of those features, that's extra surface area from a security perspective. So you have, in some sense, a choice of do you slow down the development of the business or do you be less secure. And that's that's sort of that's the problem that, that that AWS is facing, right? And so, to the rescue comes comes formal methods. So, how do we innovate quickly and securely at the same time? Uh, and that's where uh, automated reasoning uh, really fits in and really solves the big business problem that they're having. And so that's why things are going. I'm I'm going to show you some of the projects that are that we're doing, and I'll, I hope you'll see that that things are going are going pretty well. And the reason that they're going well is because it's like perfect application for formal methods uh, in terms of a, a large and growing business. So they hired me. Um, and, oh, but just to add a little bit more spice to the problem, um, it turns out that there's two fundamentally different security issues, two fundamentally different um, problems that if you're trying to, if you're trying to help the, the company move fast and stay secure, uh, because there's, there's this idea of the shared responsibility model. So the idea of the shared responsibility model is that the customer, because remember, we're providing a very general computing platform to millions of customers. And those millions of customers build complex networked infrastructure, right? They have machines, virtual machines that are networked together. They have uh, S3 buckets. They have databases. They're, you know, they have machine learning tools, all of these uh, APIs that they're calling in weird and wonderful ways, and it's their responsibility to use them correctly, right? To configure their networks correctly, to configure their policies correctly. So that's the, uh, the, the concept of security in the cloud. And then there's the um, uh, concept of security of the cloud, right? So we, as, we provide the crypto infrastructure, we provide the virtualization infrastructure, we provide the virtual networking APIs, et cetera, and then the question that customers have is, how do you know that the crypto does the right thing? How do you know that the virtualization doesn't have you know, um, memory, memory corruption errors? And so the, those, those two challenges, both formal verification can help in, bo in both cases. And it's really been much to my surprise. I, I really would not have expected four years ago joining Amazon that I would spend a lot of time with uh, security teams of financial services companies, right? Like helping them use formal methods. That that was a little bit of a shock to me. Um, so that so that's that's um, the, the 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 challenge. So let's talk about the operationalizing for formal methods. I've removed the um, the meaning of these graphs, but everything's going great, right? Um, So we were a little pilot project. So, they, so they, um, the, the, the culture is to experiment and fail fast. So to try, aggressively try lots of things and see what works and invest a little bit. And then if you are succeeding, then the organization continues to double down. And so that's, that's what we've been doing. So, so since 2014, we've been trying some things. And those things that went well, they doubled down on them. And they doubled down again. They doubled down again. So everything's going great. So we have. Uh, a large and growing organization that does formal methods, uh, automated reasoning group, but uh, but actually there's a large community of people that don't report into my organization doing formal methods. So professional services, the crypto team, virtualization team, uh, uh, network network uh, uh, security analysis tools. A lot of those teams are investing in this stuff too, and and people are from my organization sometimes shift over. We hire we hire friends of ours from the research community into those other teams, and so there's a, a growing network of, of folks doing this kind of work. Um, uh, so th this is uh, a uh, photo of some of the team. Maybe you'll know some of them. Uh, so Michael Tauschnig, uh, Sardar Tezaran, uh, Rustin Leno, uh, Ernie Cohen, 
uh, Daniel Koenig, uh, uh, John Harrison, um, Neha Rungta, Mike Whalen, et cetera. So maybe there's some faces that some of you know. Um, and then this uh, is a, a subset of, of, of folks from the team. Um, so what's the strategy of the group? The strategy was to find, to, we're, we're sort of searching and destroying, right? We didn't, we, we, we wanted to apply formal methods. We didn't know exactly what the right problems were. We didn't know where there was the most business value. So what we did is we did a sort of, we cast a wide net trying to find areas where we could apply our trade. We found some cases where things that worked out really well. We're doubling down on those. And in cases where things didn't scale, the tools didn't work, whatever, great, then we provided, you know, like that, that provides new research challenges to, uh, to folks on our team or, 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 or collaborators and, and the academic community. Um, and I've really strictly followed this strategy. This comes from Strachey, the founder of the Oxford Computer Science Department, which says that the division of theory and practice is injurious to our field, right? Basically, practitioners don't know, like theory, theoreticians don't know what to work on and practitioners don't know what they're doing, right? So, so the, the real magic, and it's, it's hot and hard and frustrating, but if you are both a researcher and a developer simultaneously, that's where the really great work is at. And so that's, that's something that we've been working really hard on. So we own services, that, that, that customers use. We handle, like there's someone on rotation handling the issues at 2 a.m. Simultaneously, we're writing research papers. We're, in, we're, we're looking at long-term and short-term goals, right? So we have goals for the, this next week and the week after and the week after, but also two years from now. And maintaining both of those mindsets at the same time is, is well, the, really been the key, the, key, the key to our success uh, at, at AWS. So um, yeah, so let's um, let's get into some of the details. So um, in AWS, and as I'll say in a few moments, for customers also, there's sort of two key activities, right, of a, of a, of a service team's life or a product team's life. First is the design, and you want to securely design, and so there's a concept of AppSec review, application security review. So every service and every feature that's shipped to customers, we do a formal application security review with the security team, and we penetration test before we ship. Um, and then you have to, often for business reasons, the service will need to meet certain uh, compliance certifications, HIPAA, for example. If we want uh, you know, like, uh, hospitals to be able to use the service, then it needs to be HIPAA compliant. So the, the, the service team uh, ahead of time makes a plan for that, decides on what the threats to worry about are, what are the mitigations, a strategy for making sure that those mitigations are correctly implemented, and a strategy for the controls for the auditors for compliance. So that's, that's the, uh, the design activity. And then there's the secure operation, right? So in the field, often you're de depending on open source, and researchers will find security vulnerabilities in open source code. So there's uh, often a question of like, how does this vulnerability that's been found by some researcher affect our service? And um, you know, th so there's these activities where you know, while the software is running, you need to maintain its security and deal with, with you know, potential incidents. And simultaneously, you're developing the next feature and working proactively to make sure it's going to be secure. And so that's, um, uh, you know, in some sense, the life of a, of a service team. And essentially, every aspect of that, of all of those activities, now have some formal methods somewhere in them. So security, compliance, secure operation, determining what's the blast radius of a p potential security vulnerability, um, and then maintaining, making sure that the every small change to the code correctly implements the mitigation that was agreed upon during the security review with the security team. Um, so, uh, for example, we are doing a lot of work on, on distributed security protocols. So there's many, you know, uh, distributed secret sharing kinds of protocols in use within AWS. So, for example, KMS the, is the key management service. This is a, like a key, um, no pun intended, uh, service that a lot of customers rely on. And it's a dis big distributed system, and so the, 
the, the question is how are the, how are the, how are the keys uh, how's that information r remains confidential while scalable? Um, and um, as probably folks here know, it's difficult to get these right. So we've been doing a lot of work um, trying to prove the correctness of these. And uh, one thing that's really caught me off guard also in joining AWS is how much uh, pull I'm getting from customers. So when I talk to the chief information security officers from financial services or government uh, or, um, or uh, pharmaceutical, it's very important to them to understand how the cloud-based distributed security protocols are maintaining their secrets. And it really takes a lot of stress off of them when they meet Ernie Cohen. Who, who's doing proofs, I know, um, uh, on, on the protocols that are maintaining their secrecy. So this is a, a big confidence booster for customers, and it's, re it's really turned out to be very important, and really a surprise to me how much I'm looped into discussions with customers about our, our practices. Um, so, and it turns out really soundness is key. So, so customers don't, they don't really care if you do 20 versus 30 versus 40 hours of penetration testing. What they, what they want to know is that you have methodologies that find all the things, and you know when you're done. And so that, 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 this idea of doing proof is really important to them. Um, and I hear lots of quotes like, you know, this is why we're going all in on the cloud. The, 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 the fact that you're doing this work and this work is growing, and this is important to AWS, this is important to me, so I'm trying to decide should I buy a bunch of machines and put them in a data center in New Jersey and hire the security guards with guns to protect it, or should I move my data to AWS and the existence of this work is the thing that sort of puts me over the edge and that now I'm going to move all my work over. So I hear that a lot. Um, so if you want to know more about this, there's a, uh, there's a paper by Ernie Cohen at the FM conference. Um, this is the foundations of Quivilla, which was mentioned in that TechCrunch article. Um, all of, a lot of the papers and talks and uh, blog posts and so on, and there's a podcast with me, are, are available on this website. So it's the um, aws.amazon.com slash blah, 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 uh, provable security. So you can find all the papers I'm pointing to, you can find on, the, on, on this web page. Um, so here's the, again, I've removed the exact details, but this shows you the growth of security protocol verification. So one thing that I've learned at Amazon is it's not about what you've done now, it's all about the growth, right? So are you, are you scaling? So are you at least 10% year-over-year growth? Or is it 10%? Oh, if it's 10%, then you're not keeping up, right? But it's 90% now, that's great, right? So you really want to see you want to see, you can do some stuff and you can just do a few cases and get it working, and then is it, is it getting better and more scalable and solving more problems? And the, and the, and the organization really pays attention to the growth of the activity. So the, this is the graph, the sort of graph we really want to see. So in 2014, we did nothing. 2015, we, we did, a, you know, did some proofs on protocols. Those turned out to be very, very impactful. Uh, we struggled to scale in 2016, and then we figured out some stuff. And so that, and that paper from Ernie describes the technique that really allowed us to scale. It's essentially a reduction of security protocol verification to a question of uh, about uh, reasoning about object-oriented programs. So you can use VCC, um, and and that continues to, to scale. Um, great. So another uh, example of of stuff we're um, uh, working on is actual uh, source code verification. So you're Virtualization code, your crypto code, memory safety, compliance to the to the like we've you know we've proved the correctness of the, some security protocol. Is the code actually implementing that protocol? Um, and then questions about compliance. So for example, are you know are we at least using bit uh, 256 bit keys? You know uh, that that kind of thing. And so we're we're doing a lot of work uh, proving proving code correct. We're using a lot of tools that you would know. Boogie and Cock and CBMC and Daphne and Hallight and Fur, OpenJML, Saw, Smack, etc. Um, and again, this work really engages customers. So this this has turned out to be a, a real game changer for uh, customers trying to understand the value proposition of the cloud. Um, 
and yeah, to that. Um, and again, it's the, the graphs going in the right direction, right? So we, we didn't do anything in 2014. We did some in 2015. We were trying to figure out how to scale in 2016. We figured that out. 2017 has been year of scale, and that, and that continues, to, continues to go on. So a few papers. Um, so, uh, so we were trying to do some proof on a streaming protocol that was implemented in Java 8, and a lot of the Java verification tools didn't support Java 8 functional programming features. So we have a paper um, at VSTTE about some reduction of the features that we saw in this, in the, in the code that we frequently see um, for existing tools, so in this case, uh, uh, OpenJML. Um, and, um, yeah, so uh, another one is, um, so it turns out that uh, if you want to have a secure virtualization stack, you need to understand the code that you're booting. So memory safety, uh, because we're so large, it would be worth the adversary's time to figure out how to use memory safety corruption errors in even the bootloader to inject the wrong code. So, so it's turned out to be very crucial to, uh, from a supply chain angle, to, to prove the correctness of the bootloaders that we, we use in the cloud. And so that's, uh, we're using CBMC. There's a paper at CAV. We had to do a bunch of extensions to CBMC. So for example, they ha handle memory mapped IO. Um, and uh, linker scripts, et cetera. Um, and um, we're using bounded model checking, but in this particular case, we're able to either find manual of the, the inductive invariance or find a, um, uh, a diameter where, where we, can, we can make the bounded model checking sound by, by, uh, by essentially unrolling the loops. And that's turned out to be really important. Um, so there's another tool called SideTrail. This is at VSTTE. So, the, the, um, uh, so Amazon has uh, so some open source call, code called S2N. It's a, about 7,000 lines of C code implementing uh, a substantial subset of TLS. And this is the basis of uh, our IoT offerings, the dash button. I don't know if you've, you've ever had the, you use the dash button. So it's like this button that when you press it, it'll send more coffee to your house. Um, and, but it's also the TLS used in S3, right? So, so uh, you know, like the, what must be one of the largest uh, services in the world is, this is the, this is the crypto that's uh, making that communication uh, secure. So this turns out to be very important. And there's a particular mitigation for side channel attacks, timing-based side channel attacks that's implemented in, the, in that code. And so we have proved the correctness of that mitigation uh, using a side trail. And that uh, underneath uses SMAC. Um, here's another one. So this is a CAV paper. So this is um, proving, for uh, that same S2N code, the TLS implementation, we need to prove that the, um, the uh, HMAC implementation is correct, that the protocol like the handshake protocol implementation is correct, the deterministic random bit generator implementation is correct, and so we're using, uh, together with Galois, we're using uh, a tool that they have called SAW that, that allows us to encrypt all to express the properties that we'd like to prove of the code, and then we, and then we prove that code. And the really, this is, um, uh, I've seen this, so for example, Peter Hearn from uh, Facebook has given uh, a series of talks that really hammers this point home, and, the, and this really became clear to me too, that the real value of these kinds of tools is in the integration with the DevOps world, right? So in, so in the, the code review system and the frequent changes to code, if you, sick, if you go and find some code that was written a year ago and find some bugs in it, it's gonna be very difficult for you to get those changes made in the code because the developer's thinking about something else now, or they've, they're working on a different project, or they've left the company or something. Whereas if you find bugs when they're doing the code review, so now there's a couple of eyeballs, you know, sets of eyeballs looking at the code, and you report right then saying, oh, the proof failed, here's why, you're gonna get a really massive up, uh, you know, change rate based on that. And so that's something that happens here. So with every check-in, 
via Travis CI, we, we rerun the proof. Uh, and um, so then the challenge there, though, is that, uh, you know, if you have a few people doing the proof, and now they're sleeping, but someone on, you know, in the open source community is trying to make a change, and they've broken the proof, you, what do you do, right? Or they've changed the code, so now, they, and they don't understand proof, right? So how do you make the proof methodology robust up to changes that you typically are going to see from programmers? And so that, that this paper at CAV describes some techniques there. Um, great, said all that. Um, so that's uh, security um, of the cloud, and now let's talk about security in the cloud. So again, the customers have the same thing. They're, they're, they would like to write secure software. They need to achieve compliance. They, they have some mitigations in mind, and then now they've deployed it, and now they're trying to operate it uh, securely. So um, how do they do that? Um, and again, it's the uh, kind of the same approaches, but now we're actually putting tools into the services for customers. Um, so uh, for example, there's this idea of uh, IAM, so it's uh, short for Identity and Access Management. And essentially, uh, I, the IAM language, so there's a language for describing who, when, what, why, how, where, things can be accessed, right? Who are you, what do you have access to, and you can, and you can, you can assume roles, so you're like, oh, I'm, I'm this person, but now I've just taken on these other roles, and now that gives me other things I can do. All of those activities are essentially it's, there's a language for describing this, and it's essentially for Fertile Logic. Uh, and so you can imagine the customers get for Fertile Logic wrong, right? So um, here, for example, is uh, uh, some customers trying to figure out what they did wrong. So they're, they're trying to allow the SNS service, so that's a simple notification service, all APIs, so SNS star, so all APIs that are SNS APIs, access to anything. But they don't want to allow delete. So everything but delete. So they're allowing a not action, which is turns out as they discover in the in the thread. And it's in, it's interesting. Look at that. So there's there's um, there's 24 users there currently discussing that. Right, so that's the sort of scale we're talking about of the, 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 the number of users and, and people all the time trying to figure out first order logic. Um, so what they've done is they've, they've, um, they've misunderstood the semantics of not action. So it really what they needed to say was deny the action anything SNS delete star on, on star. So allow anything but, but, but deletes. And one might ask, oh, well, like, wh what's this not action? Why do you need not action? And it turns out that not action is really crucial to some customers. And so this is something that I've um, it sort of hit home to me that the common wisdom is uh, one of the reasons that there are so many bugs is because the languages or techniques we're trying to use are so complicated. And it's like, oh, if we just simplified everything, that would make everything better. But the problem is, is that when you have millions of customers, there's going to be billion-dollar customers who are like, well, actually, the, the techniques that you're providing to me don't allow me to do what I need to do. So you're going to add features for them to allow them to do what they're trying to achieve. And then now those features are going to be available to everybody. And there's a ton of, there's a, you know, a drawer full of kitchen knives now, and customers are hurting themselves. So, so, they, so the formal verification really plays an important role here of helping customers use the complex structures that some customers need, but a lot of customers don't need. Um, so anyways, the, um, uh, the semantics, I could, th there's a paper I'll, I'll point you to, but basically we, we go through this example. It turns out the semantics of the policy language means that this, this policy is just saying take any request and always say yes because, the, because of the disjunction. Um, uh, I, I, won't, I won't go through the details. But with that deny, it turns out that it's the NIC conjunction. So now it's saying this, the semantics are um, uh, access is allowed by a context request if all of the allows are yes and none of the denies are no. And so that turns out to be very important. Um, and so what we've done is uh, we've built a SMT-based 
uh, in a, a, you know, a comparator, small comparators. We take two policies and we ask, is this policy strictly less than or, or, or not to the, the policy on the right? And that turns out to be a very, very, very important thing. And this is used by a lot of services in AWS. So we call this Zilkova. Um, and so basically, now with this, you can say, well, you know, here's all of the policies uh, that, that my hundreds of employees are using in my enterprise. And now I don't want to allow that policy, right? Because that's just allowing access to everything. So let's rule that out by saying, well, I don't, I don't want to, I'm going to write E1 is, a, is a, like a guardrail saying, please, please require that all the policies that my organization uses are at least less than E1. And then you can set a, a series of guardrails and get the, the space of policies that you're comfortable with. Um, and then that disallows. And so that's, that's used in a lot of services. So for example, um, uh, config, there's a service that, that detects changes in your AWS account and then will run activities. And one of the activities that's available to customers, and it's $2 per rule, per account, per region, it calls Z3. And, uh, and it's saying, uh, oh, you're, the change you've just made actually uh, doesn't meet one of the guardrails that you've, that you've signed up for. Um, and then there's other services that are there. So here, are, for, for example, some of those rules. But S3, Trusted Advisor, um, the, the console, the S3 console uses this. So this little symbol saying, oh, I have a, uh, an open bucket, that's, that's a call to this tool called Zilkova. Um, and, uh, and so on. So IoT Device Defender is a new, is a new product that, that's using AWS, uh, using Zilkova. And the, um, the, here's the calls on a logarithmic scale. And we're, we're getting many millions of calls a day now to that service. Um, and it's forecast is for continued growth. There's a nice blog post about it. Um, soundness is key. You don't want to say, hey, we did all this math analysis, but oops, we missed a case, sorry, right? It turns out soundness is really important. And there's a paper at FMCAD all about this, so you can read, you can read about that. And then here's the um, Chief Information Security Officer and v Corporate VP of Security discussing at his reInvent keynote the use of CVC4 and Z3. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, all right, and then, so then the, then the, um, the, uh, the last example is the idea of, of virtual networks. So it turns out that in this classic cloud scenario where you have many virtual machines. You network them together in weird and wonderful ways. And then there's all kinds of rules that you want to hold based on compliance, based on security posture that you would like to hold of your networks. And they're hard to establish and hard to get right. So there's an idea of virtual private cloud. And so you, uh, this is a sort of a classic AWS network photo uh, diagram where you have these instances and services, and they're connected up, and there's VPCs around them, and they, they're configured with security groups, and all, the, all this complex machinery that you know customers need, and sometimes they get them a little bit wrong. So the question is, does this network meet the, the enterprise-wide security or compliance requirements that they have? For example, for PCI. So here, for example, is some of the rules for PCI. PCI is the credit, if you, if you handle credit card data, you want to be PCI compliant. It protects you from lawsuits. And it turns out a lot of these you can encode in logic. So uh, here, for example, for all machines, if it's tagged cardholder, then you don't want it to be connected directly to the internet. That's a rule that PCI says. It's like a, it's an, like a, uh, just a, a, it's, it's like this is how you set up your, your infrastructure. And if you're not set up like this, and then you're hacked, then you're not protected legally by the, by the compliance. And so it turns out we can, we can use those, use constraint solving to solve this. So that here's all the concepts from networking that are virtualized and provided to customers. And then we take the semantics of all of these concepts together with the customer network representation, because it's all virtual, and then, and then call currently souffle, which is the data log, partial evaluation data log constraint solver that I think there was a CAF paper on a couple years ago. Um, but we're also using Monosat in some cases. So um, to, to solve these. And again, you know, the call volume's going up and everything's great. Um, and, and actually, this morning, we announced, uh, if you're friends with me on Facebook or LinkedIn, you will have seen that we announced a new service today uh, that in Inspector. So Inspector now has a symbolic network reachability assessment feature for customers. So it takes, you 
turn it on, it goes into your network, and there's a bunch of best practices, and it says, you violated this best practice, here's here's what I would suggest you do to do something better, and that uses the constraint solving to, to answer those questions. Great. Uh, oh, and so uh, this is a an ad for a talk by two of the security engineers from Bridgewater Associates. Bridgewater Associates is the largest hedge fund in the world, and they're big believers in my group and in formal verification. So uh, they've been using beta versions of these tools for a while, and they give a talk at the New York City Loft, uh, the New York City AWS Summit uh, this summer, uh, talking about their use of Tiros and Zelkova, the, the, the constraint solving for networks and policies. Um, uh, great. So uh, let me talk a little bit about suggestions for future work. And here I run a danger, right, where I say, we should be doing this. And then you're going to be like, but wait, I did that in Popple last year, right? So I don't mean to slight your work. I mean, if you're doing this, then you're doing a great job, right? And then you should keep doing it. So I'm just, I'm just making recommendations based on what I'm seeing, things, the trends, things that we should be working on. And if you're doing it, great. And let's do it. And tell me about it, and we'll probably use your tool. Um, so, um, so first of all, you know, like, kind of obvious, but like, there's lots of APIs for machine learning. There's lots of developer tools. There's lots of uh, Internet of Things APIs. And can we do proofs about the correctness of machine learning implementations or usage of machine learning? Privacy, for example. Uh, can we, you know, show? security and privacy invariance of uh, solutions built on top of IoT infrastructure, et cetera. That's something that would be great to work on. Can we, so currently, in the formal methods community, I, I know there's going to be a few people who say it's not true, but I'm just going to say it anyways. We basically write uniprocessor formal verification tools, right? You, you get it working on your machine, and then, like, you maybe put it in a server and run it, and maybe you have a portfolio server, where, a portfolio solver where you have like three or four engines and you try them. And I know in industry there's some very sophisticated portfolio-based applications, but we've not gone the extra step where you say, let's build a proper distributed symbolic model checker where there's many machines running and they're doing different parts of the search and finding different candidate inductive invariants and communicating progress towards the solutions of those inductive invariants to each other across the network. That I'm not, not really seeing. And it turns out there's this huge computer in the sky that's really cheap, and it's pay as you go. And we, if we could figure out how to build such a monster, we, would, we could do so much more than we're able to do right now. And that also is true with, with regards to you know, mechanical verification, like, like theorem proving, right? So currently, the techniques are basically based on or Larry Paulson keep in their head as they're trying to do a proof. And there's not really a cloud-based tactic that tries, that, that uses the full com computer to find a proof. And so that's a, a challenge that I, I think we should, should really be thinking about. So more, more than portfolio servers. Turns out there's this wonderful world of specification. So the, one of the challenges for us in, form, in the formal verification community is to know what is, like, what is it we're supposed to be proving. And what I've discovered is that with compliance and with security, this idea of the threat model and the mitigations, the choice of mitigation, is a fantastic opportunity for a set of specifications. And so that's something that we're working on, but we'd really love to see more tools and more th thinking about the formal connection between threat model, mitigation choice, and how, and how to prove those mitigations. And similarly for compliance, what's the control that's, that's, that's allowing you to achieve certification, and how do you prove that certification, and how do you track that for the lifetime of the software? Um, right. Um, can we synthesize repair? Right. So this policy is wrong. Can we suggest a better policy? This network is wrong. Can we suggest a better network to the customer? Right. Could we synthesize a repair? Those are some questions that are kind of open. So another thing about security is that uh, nothing is secure. No machine is secure. We're not secure. 
okay? So it's all about probability. It's all about risk, right? So how do you, and you have limited resources, so you're gonna try and make the system more secure. So how do you do that? How do you decide, oh, these things are scary and these things aren't scary? And so, for example, if you find a bug that only one person needs to understand and only one person needs to do one action to trigger, and it gives access to all the world's information, that's a really bad bug, right? But on the other hand, if there's a bug where Venus and Mars need to align, and it's only going to give away the phone number you had as a child, that's not a very interesting bug, right? But they're both vulnerabilities. And so the, the question of what's the risk and how do we reason about the risk, what I see in the security field is people are thinking very, very informally about these things. And so they have a notion of high judgment, right? Where they, they just, they, they, they sort of informally think about it and try and try and prioritize activities. But I think that in our field, we have a lot to, to add here where uh, we, we can help organizations decide which risks should be addressed before other risks uh, and which vulnerabilities have a high probability or a low probability of getting high value information or low value information. That would be super helpful. And I haven't, you know, I, I haven't seen that work. So that would be interesting. Um, uh, another thing I see uh, a lot, so, so there's some, some so since, since I'm involved in operationalizing formal verification, uh, one of the things that I've seen, and I guess it shouldn't have been a surprise, I was an intern at Intel in the 90s, right? And when they were operationalizing proof on circuits, and so I, I know that they hit the same problem, but it sort of hit me again, is that we make many simplifying assumptions when we're doing proofs, right? We assume the control flow graph of the program is going to remain the control flow graph of the program. We assume that the garbage collector is correct. We assume that the microprocessor, when we're doing a proof about code, we're assuming that the microprocessor is correct. And uh, somehow the result that we've done a proof gets oversimplified, and suddenly everyone's saying the program will never have a bug, right? And that's not true. So tracking what those assumptions were and trying to knock off those assumptions later and building like, like that idea of the clink stack, right? The full proof from the beginning to the end and tracking all of the things that need to be proved, uh, I, th I think is important. Um, compliance is a really interesting one. So I'm giving a talk at, um, at reInvent in, in right after Thanksgiving uh, with uh, a compliance auditor and the VP of compliance at Amazon about our use of formal verification on networks, policies, and source code to help establish compliance. So this is a, a I think there's a, there's a lot to be a lot to be done here. And then and then all of the um, the normal things: usability, predictability, fidelity, low-level languages, high-level languages, uh, a sim, you know, like um, concurrency. All that still is a problem for us. Um, so, anyways, uh, let me wrap up. Um, so. We use your tools, we hire your students, right? We uh, read your papers, we, the number of people who have tools that we use, we're giving them data, we can give you data, we can give you, we can run your tools and tell how you it's working, you can make changes and we'll run it and tell you how it's working. So a lot of this work that I'm describing is actually a joint uh, community effort. And so we're tapping into the academic research community, and, and that's been really helpful. So I really, I, I mean, first of all, thank you. I really appreciate that. But also, like, we can still, we can do more of that. So that's something to, to consider. Um, and if your students are able to code, then uh, they should consider com coming. Or maybe you would want to come, but you need to be able to code. That's important. Um, and so uh, so thanks for your time and attention. Thanks for your students. Uh, th some of you have been, have had great turnaround on bug fixes on your tools. I appreciate that, and also wanted to say thank you to a lot of the people um, who've who've been doing this for a while, who I, who I learned a lot from. So they're listed there. Um, uh, so th thanks very much. I can repeat the question too. Belt it out. Microarchitecture level, there's leaks everywhere, and and those are by 
the leaks at the microarchitectural level are by definition outside of your formal models. have you thought about what the next generation of verification may need in terms of finding those side channels and and if you will model them and what you need to do? i'm going to show my industrialist roots by saying i can't say very much about it but um ah but yeah we have been doing some thinking about that and i think the thing to do is to i saw this cacm article recently about doing proofs ah reasoning about programs that are always on running on 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 untrusted ah supply chain and so it's a it's an interesting challenge to write programs that are correct even when the underlying infrastructure is incorrect and ah it's something i would really like to 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 be do better and ah i think it's a fantastic opportunity for the research community to say to have more accurate models of microarchitecture ah but also to think about how would i write a program and how would i prove it correct when sometimes the operations aren't doing what the operations are supposed to be doing and and yeah so I, I, it's an open area definitely i don't have good answers more questions so you have a team of experts doing your verification i feel like your mic's not on yeah oh uh, so you have a team of experts doing your verification work yeah uh, which is great I'm wondering what your thoughts are and what it would take to make it possible for, say, someone with an undergraduate CS degree to do the same kind of work. What advances in the field do we need before that, that can happen? So I think the so I think the question is like kind of like hidden in your question is the assumption that everyone has a PhD in my team. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'll tell you my dream. There's there's no distributed systems group at Amazon, right? Because everybody's a distributed systems engineer. So every every you talk to every team and they know all about just they've read all the papers they understand distributed systems super deeply, and a lot of teams don't have deep expertise in formal verification. So I think it's it's a uh, it's a maturity and education issue, but the, a lot of the assumptions I had have been proved wrong. So it turns out that, for example, the reason I'm getting so much traction with, with financial services, is that most of the people I'm talking to on the customer side studied under Zohar Mana, right? Or studied under, you know, like studied at the schools where they teach Coq theorem proving and and uh, symbolic model checking. And so I can actually have very reasonable discussions about techniques with them, and increasingly. The undergraduates I'm seeing do have these expertise. So the old timers often are either crafty formal verification people, or I've heard that doesn't work, and I'll never listen to you or your thoughts about it, kind. So there's a real division. But in the in the more junior set, people are much more open-minded, and they have done these kinds of work, and they've they've used the tools, and they worked, and and so on. So it's actually not hard to ramp up the youth. On these tools, I found actually. So I think it's getting better. And then what I, what I'm what I've done at Amazon is to try and show value for these techniques so that the teams invest in this work, and that's really happening now. So I see, uh, for example, this inspector product, so the inspector feature that uses constraint solving. They've hired a couple of people from our space. Uh, so John Bax, for example, works in that team applying uh, formal verification techniques. Uh, with that team, so that so there, I'm seeing the different teams invest in that, and so what will, and I definitely see that in crypto, and I see that in virtualization, that there's expertise um, in those teams, and so, and some of those people don't have PhDs, so so it's it's the 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 techniques are the the bar for the bar the uh, bar for entry is going down, so I th that's a, the trend is good, I'd say. Sorry, that's a long answer. <laughs> Uh, you said you have. I feel like it was on, but maybe. Yeah, it's on. Okay. Let it rip. Uh, you said you have a lot of verification of the source code using Coq. Yeah. But do you rewrite your source code into Coq to verify it, or which languages? Like, uh, how, yeah. how the process works. So uh, in that, so in that, one of the cases that's interesting, we, so the S2N. Uh, HMAC proof, and this is described in the CAF paper. We, uh, with SAW, which is the Galois tool, we prove 
a number of very low level invariants expressed in cryptol of the c code at the ah llvm level and then we do in and and the thing is is that those invariants are designed such that if the code changes a lot we probably don't break the proof and so that way so in the like the last thousand check-ins to s2n in only three cases did we have to involve a formal verification person to repair uh, now the cryptol invariants are now something that we use to build a larger meta level proof in cock so we've translated the the galois the the cryptol invariants into cock and then do reasoning in cock and that doesn't change so it sort of sits there saying that's the reason that these other things so the combination of that reasoning and the lower level stuff together form the proof thanks yeah. and uh just curious do you uh, also migrate to some safer la languages your code base or you work on low level stuff and yeah so there's um there's a lot of java at, uh, at amazon in the virtualization and and um crypto organizations there's a lot of c code but increasingly i'm seeing adoption of rust um and so there's a um, yeah, so 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 Rust is something I'm hearing a lot about, and uh, so I'm 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 interested, for example, in pr proof tools for Rust. I think that would be a good investment. All right. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Byron.